Well, this is the point where we'll be doing some intro music if we had intro music. <laughs> hello there, good people. Today, me saying hello, good people is kind of uh, kind of special because we actually do have some good people out there watching today. Uh, one of them, of course, is author David the Good, one of my heroes. <laughs> hey, David, how you doing? I like to uh, I like to to start out videos by saying hello, good people, and it's, it's it's kind of a an inside joke that a lot of the people that I'm talking to are also people that that watch David. But of course, all people I think want to be good. I better talk stop talking before I get myself in trouble. Hi, hi everybody, how you doing? All right, I see. Hey, hey, no problem at all. <clears throat> um, it's good having you here for one of these. And now, and now I'm a little bit nervous because, as I said, David's one of my heroes, so <laughs> he's he's watching. <laughs> oh, don't worry, Mary. I can cook all the rubber eggs you like. So what are we doing today? Uh, we're picking up where we left off. This time we're talking about the different layers and roles in a in a permaculture system. Unturf with Russell Balestrini says, hello, I'm a YouTuber too. Awesome. We'll have to check your stuff out. Uh, really quick, if somebody has the ability to, uh, to post links, uh, if you could put up the link for David the Goods channel, incidentally. I keep on saying a lot of times that if I know anything, it's probably because I have good teachers and David's one of them. Uh, so everybody say hi to David. Let me get over here to my to my materials and get the screen blown up a little bit. All right, so today we're going to start out by talking about the layers in a food forest. And on this 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 little graphic here, we have a few of the layers outlined, but there's there's more than what I had room for on this on this page. Starting at the very top, we have our canopy layer. This is our tallest trees, probably the ones that take the longest to grow. And whenever you're putting your, your system together, this is most likely the first ones that you're going to plant. The choices that you make for what goes in this layer will have a great influence on everything that comes underneath. Underneath the canopy layer, we have understory layer. And I like to include shrub and understory layer together. Uh, they are two separate distinct layers, but because most of your understory trees, if you can see from the example here, the top of the tree, the crown of the tree, grows up to in that same space that your canopy layer tree occupies in a lot of cases. This isn't true everywhere. And you can do some prodigious pruning of your canopy layer trees to create more room for an understory tree. But keep in mind, you won't be able to always get both an understory and a shrub layer, both under whatever you're using for a canopy tree. Uh, the system that I'm building right now, I'm using pecans as my canopy tree. Pecans get pretty big, so I have a little bit more room for understory trees to fit under a pecan tree. Although still, in a lot of cases, these, these smaller trees are going to be offset a little bit. So this one might be around here and not here, if that makes any sense. So shrub and understory both together. Shrub, of course, is your shorter stuff maybe up to 10, 12 feet or tall, 10 or 12 feet or so, maybe up to 15. After that, we have the herbaceous layer. These are your, your woody perennials, things that grow anywhere from about calf high to about chest high, smaller than shrubs. Some of these wind up growing all the way down to the ground, which is where we have our, our next layer, which is the ground cover layer running all across the ground. So in some cases, your herbaceous layer plants will occupy ground cover space as well. After that, we have a vining layer, which is simply those plants that like to grow up and into your trees all the way up into the canopy or into the understory. Hardy kiwis, kiwis if you're further, further south, um, grapevines, even a sweet potato can occupy this role. Sweet potatoes also can occupy the ground cover layer, depending upon how you train those vines to grow. You can train them to grow out and cover the ground. You can train them to go up into the trees either way, or sometimes a mixture of both, if you like. The next layer down is where I hit controversial territory. 
because a lot of people will say the next layer down is the root layer. And I disagree. I, I don't think there is a root layer. I know. Cue, cue the torches and pitchforks. But there is, as far as, far as I'm concerned, there is no root layer in a permaculture system. And the reason I say that is because if you think about the things that grow beneath the surface, where they get their energy from, what's growing down here? The only thing growing down here that's actually deriving its energy below the surface of the ground are fungi. Those are making connections with the roots of the shrubs, with the herbaceous plants, with the trees, with the understory plants, with the things at the ground cover, things in the vining layer. And they're getting their energy through the photosynthesis that these guys are doing. Or in the case of saprotrophs, they're getting their energy by breaking down organic material. But there is no plant that grows and derives its energy from below the ground. So instead of calling this the root layer, I'm calling this the fungal layer because that's more appropriate. One could also call the fungal layer that portion that comes up into the trees. There are fungi that grow on the surface of trees. Not all of them are parasitic. But that brings us to, uh, well, that's the seven layers. Any questions so far before I get any further down the road? Now, rise of spheres as, as a force layer. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's just the, the, the terminology that, that people use for this. They say, well, potatoes, they grow in that in that in that root layer. No, they don't. The, they have roots down there. Everything has roots down there. But the potato is getting us energy. If we're talking about a regular potato, it's getting us energy in that herbaceous layer or maybe the ground cover layer, maybe a little bit of the, a little bit of the both. But it's not getting us energy down there in the root layer. So. I don't see a point in there being something that we call a root layer when that's not really what it is. Let me get over here so I can see what the, the current chat is. Uh, I am currently planning in zone 7A. David is asking what zone I'm planning on. I'm in 7A. David is in 8B. We have a lot of things that we can grow in common. Although he can get away with a few things at, at 8B that I can't. <laughs> and I think his winters are uh, are a bit more temperate than ours are too. Substrate layers, says Hunter. Yeah, yeah, very, a very good range in, in seven. We can grow things that, are, that can grow all the way up in zone four. We can grow things that we're all the way down to zone 10 and everywhere in between, depending upon how we how we work the microclimate. So who all do we have in here? We've got we've got Mary, we've got David, we've got Unturf with Russell Balestrini. And there's John, my cousin John Conrad's in here. Says he'll be in and out. Bushcraft family, hi, how you doing? Three owls. Hello, three owls. All right. Let me get back to the get back to the presentation here on rolls and layers. I think that is about it for for layers. Uh, let's talk about rolls for a little bit. And if you're wondering what I'm looking at here on the screen, I'm looking at. Um, I'm looking at my my notes. <laughs> my notes are available on my on my blog uh, at our website greencountryagroforestry.com. And uh, whenever I'm talking about the things that are that are on here, I will deviate from what I wrote in the blog post to a certain extent. But uh, the information in the blog post is always going to be up there. And of course, you can always leave comments and questions and anything else. And if I don't know the answer, I'll find somebody who does. Uh, there are a lot of really knowledgeable people in the YouTube community that we can consult on a variety of different things. Um, first thing I want to talk about when doing design is what kind of yield are you looking for? I'm a little bit more than obsessed with food security. Uh, my own personal choice for the primary food is ah, I can't talk. My personal choice for what goes at goes out as my yield. What am I looking for is food and most importantly, staple foods. Those are those foods that provide calories or proteins and preferably both. 
If you happen to live in a climate where there aren't any good choices for staples or the choices available don't appeal to you, then it's likely that in order to get them from the land, you're going to require animal fats or proteins, in which case your first priority would be to find sources of food for those animals. But whatever your primary focus is, everything that's selected should either be fulfilling that role or fulfilling a role that supports that focus in some way. All right, so after staples, the uh, vital role that needs to be filled is fertility. Nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, obviously. Um, if it's a purely plant-based system, the target that I'm looking for is it gonna be about a third of the plants or more possibly providing those base nutrients back into the system. So look for nitrogen fixing trees, shrubs, herbaceous plants and ground covers and accumulators of your potassium and phosphorus to grow and use for living mulch or cut for compost. Uh, there's some superstars that accumulate nutrients that we can pick out. One of those is the genus Chinopodium, which includes quinoa, lamb's quarters, good king henry, and a bunch of other ones. Uh, those plants will accumulate nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, calcium, and manganese. If, and this is an if, those nutrients are present in the soil or the subsoil. Most of them would occupy the herbaceous layer, and many of them are also edible by humans or they're useful as a feed for some animals. Um, I, I would note that uh, lamb's quarters, quinoa, good, good King Henry, although they accumulate nitrogen in the plant, they store it, they don't actually produce it. So you would need something that you can plant alongside of it that would generate that nitrogen for you. Clover is good, alfalfa is good, a wide number of different, uh, of different trees and shrubs can be planted that are good for getting nitrogen into the system. Uh, they form an association with bacteria on the roots to pull nitrogen out of the air and feed that to the plant and to the surrounding plants through the nodules that are produced on the roots. Whenever you prune your trees back, those nodules will drop off, at least some of them, and that will help to feed everything around it. Uh, what do we have here? Got a picture of some lamb's quarters in front of a wood pile. If you're living in the temperate zones, you've probably seen this plant here. Okay, the notes, hang on just a second. I'll give you the, uh, the link right here. I have it posted at the top of the chat. But here it is also. Right there. Hello, cliffside permaculture. Cliffside permaculture is up in Pennsylvania where it is cold right now. Today we've been struggling with it being a little bit warmer than I like. <laughs> and she is growing, cliffside permaculture culture is growing literally on the side of a cliff. She's got a drop that's oh, trying to, about like that maybe, pretty steep. You have to walk sideways to go down. And she's just growing straight up the side of the cliff, which is pretty cool. It's an excellent utilization of the space that she has to work with. <laughs> That's quite all right, Russell. <laughs> Of course I remembered. I think what you're doing is really cool because I, I like to talk about how we can take arable land and convert it to, to better use by moving to, to, to permaculture instead of monocrop agriculture. But there are some places that are by no way, shape or form considered arable land that can still be incredibly productive. And the, the experiments that you're doing there on the side of that hill are an excellent example of that. All right, let's get back over here. Oh, go back to a shared view. All right, some other example of some superstars, members of the genus Rumix, that includes some docks and sorrels, also do a fine job of accumulating calcium, which is important for building strong cell walls, phosphorus and potassium, and a bunch of those are also edible. The genus Stellaria, which includes chickweed and various species, occupies the ground cover layer and accumulates phosphorus, potassium, and manganese. Chickweed is yet another edible plant in this category. 
there are a whole bunch of other dynamic accumulators that uh, may not necessarily be MVPs, but they deserve a mention. One that a lot of people love to talk about, and I don't even really consider it to be that that big of an MVP, but it's, it's, it's a notable mention, is Comfrey. It accumulates nitrogen. Of course, it doesn't produce it, but it can accumulate it. Potassium, calcium, magnesium, and iron. So if any of those minerals are important to anything that you're growing, Comfrey might be a, a good plant to, to plant as a companion for chop and drop. Borage, which I've grown, is an excellent miner for potassium. It's also edible. The leaves taste like cucumbers. And amaranthus, which I also grow, also deserves a mention for accumulating phosphorus. It produces a lot of seeds that you can eat as they are, although they're, they're small and hard and a little bit gritty, but you can pop them like a popcorn, uh, use them as soups or sprout them for microgreens. Uh, personally, I like to leave the amaranth just as it is. I'll harvest a few seeds uh, for my own use and let the rest of them just stay out there with the plant. And then the birds that are overwintering can come through and eat those at their leisure. So it, it provides a, a source of fodder for migratory wild birds. And I want those wild birds to be in the landscape because come spring, they're going to be busily running around harvesting insects to feed to their little babies. And an insect that a bird eats is an insect I don't have to worry about. Okay, I mentioned about dynamic accumulators before, and I, I think it bears repeating. Uh, first, I want to reflect on the principle of balance. If there's something that you are taking out of your out of your land as a yield, it's going to be leaving the site. Try to find a way to bring that back and put it back into your soil. Garlic's a good example. It may make a great cash crop but it's going to use a lot of nitrogen and it's going to use a lot of sulfur. So you can consider planting mulberry trees to accumulate sulfur from the subsoil and use the leaves to mulch the garlic beds. Um, second, don't confuse the term accumulation with production. If a plant's a hyperaccumulator of a particular nutrient, nitrogen, for example, but does not also produce nitrogen as a nitrogen-fixing plant, you should be planting it in combination with a nitrogen fixer or some other source of nitrates, manure, for example. All right, number three. If a nutrient is not available in the soil or subsoil, it doesn't matter how adept your plant is at accumulating. See, note number two. The soil pH plays a, a role in the availability of nutrients. Uh, the sweet spot for soil pH is going to be somewhere between six and a half and seven. Um, you may consider using calcium accumulating plants to produce mulch that will tend to raise the pH and sulfur accumulating plants to lower your pH. Uh, let's see. Finally, the plants that I've mentioned previously should not be considered to be a list of dynamic accumulators. There's just, that's just a few examples. There's a whole bunch of those out there. Um, at some point I'll be compiling an expanded list of potential accumulators, but that won't even be anywhere near close to what I would consider a complete list. And at some point in the future when I can afford it, I want to get a, uh, a gas chromatograph and a good hydroponic setup so we can actually find out what the truth is about some of these plants that have been listed as accumulators as opposed to what they really do. Um, if I can set up laboratory conditions where we can grow a plant with the appropriate amount of nutrients available to it, we can see what it can really take up into itself if conditions are optimal for it. And that would let us know if that is a true accumulator or not. At the moment, this research hasn't been done by anybody that I know of. So that's something that I want to do at some point in the future, but if somebody else beats me to it, go for it. <laughs> because we really do need that kind of information. At the moment, we're, we're going with um, shared sources, which are not entirely verifiable. It's a lot of anecdotal information and uh, having solid data would be wonderful. Before I get too much further, I'm gonna show you four pictures and we'll talk about what we're seeing in the pictures a little bit. And I also want to check and see what's going on with the comments before I get too far far along. Okay. Cliffside permaculture cross country skiing earlier. Oh boy, <laughs> we haven't had snow since December. And Cliffside permaculture says yes, she's growing uh, Phoenix oyster and wine cap. We're doing Italian oyster and wine cap out here. Hello, Paul at Conrad Homestead. How are you doing tonight? Hello, Simply Jan.
Oh, okay. Well, I ran a little bit late. I was watching Alaskan Prepper uh, just before. Yeah, and they they said yeah, a lot of info just gets passed around again and again and again. I heard somebody say this. Somebody wrote this in their book. Uh, they seem to know what they're talking about, so I'm going to go with it. Well, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> if it sounds good, maybe it is. So there's no harm in trying a lot of things. Uh, but I, I really would like to eventually have the concrete data that we can share out to people and go, yes, this is the concrete data. This is this. Here are the facts and. Unfortunately, there's there's not a lot of that research that's actually getting done by universities because universities are doing research that is paid for by typically individuals with deep pockets with agendas and also by companies that want data that they can use for their own businesses. So we really do need to make that move towards us being that, that category of businesses that pays for the research. Either we're doing it ourselves, we're having to buy the equipment and doing it ourselves, or making the endowments to the university saying, hey, we want you to do this research. We need the data on these things. And that's about the only way we're gonna see that kind of data come out. Um, otherwise, it's 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 going to, it's being paid for by whoever it is that, uh, that can benefit from it that's paying for it. They don't just do pure research because it would be nice to know. Hello, Carl. Carl's off the grid. And hello, John. Will it grow? I watched that uh, that premiere yesterday that David did uh, where they taste tested the vegetables. They had six different beds, six different ways of setting up how to grow vegetables and then tested them off against each other to see which vegetables tasted better. And also, I guess, to a certain extent, which vegetables turned out better. Uh, not surprisingly, 10, 10, 10 commercial fertilizer was not that great. <laughs> I believe he said, uh, Solomon's mix was the best. And then lasagna gardening was the best after that. And then biochar was the next best after that. And, uh, I really like what you were saying about the, the biochar having a, having a, what, just to the palate, the bricks that was pretty high, sweet tasting. That that's a, a pretty good recommendation to me. And I think we need to explore using biochar a bit more. Charged biochar. You can't just throw charcoal in the ground and 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 make it work. You have to soak it in something that's going to carry the nutrients. Otherwise the biochar will soak up the nutrients until it's charged. So soak your biochar first in your liquid fertilizer, then mix it in. I don't know what ratio David used off the top of my head. I go, would go with maybe about a 10% at maximum, 10% biochar. Hello, Hickory Croft Farm. Hope you guys are doing good out there tonight. Let's get back into it. I got some pictures to show you. This first picture looks to me to be some sort of an allium flower. I could be wrong, but that looks like an allium to me. And all around it, we have an ant here, 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 here. There's one off in the corner here. And these little green things. Does anybody know what these little green things are? Well, these ants are an awful lot like dairy farmers. They're taking care of these little green things. These little green things are sucking the juices out of the stem of this plant. Right up here near the flower. And you may see these. In your, in your yard, in your garden, on your plants. These, of course, are aphids, and the ants are milking them for honeydew. That's the, the sweet stuff that the aphids secrete. Incidentally, whenever you're out there and you're pulling up uh, weeds or maybe you're, you're tending your pea, pea vines or something of that nature, and you feel something sticky on your hands, that's honeydew. It comes from aphids, that stickiness. It's all over the surface of the plants whenever the aphids have been there. So the aphids are busy sucking the juices out of the plant. They're producing the honeydew. The ants are drinking up that honeydew. They love the taste of it. And they protect the aphids from predators. You may have seen something like this. These things right here in your garden on leaves. There are all different kinds of eggs, but you may have seen some that look like this. I'm sorry, there's not a close-up picture of this. I got this picture from Pixabay. It's not one that I took myself. 
I'll try to get a close up if I can find them myself to show you at some point in the future. These are yellowish, golden colored to orange colored oblong eggs. They could be either on the underside or on the top of your of your plants. And if you've seen them, let me ask you something. Have you gone out and squished them the minute you saw them? Because, you know, insects, eggs on your plants, you don't want those hatching, do you? All right, this next picture here. Some kind of a monster. Look at that thing. Oh, my gosh. What is that? That looks ugly. Just ugly. That's an ugly bug. Ew. If you see this, would you squish it? Well, it does appear to be doing something with these other little bugs. What are those? Some sort of stink bug? Possibly in that, in that genera? Well, it's eating them. Maybe this one isn't an enemy after all, but it looks ugly. How about this? This one here. Does anybody know what this guy is? Before I go any further, I'm going to jump over here and look at the comments, see if we have some guesses. Kill it with fire, David says. <laughs> All right. Yep. First one is, yes, ants tending the aphids. Somebody know what the second picture was? See if somebody knew what the second picture was with the with the with the eggs. Does anybody at all know what the second picture was? Hickory Croft Farm had it. Ladybug eggs. Yes. Those are ladybug eggs. Well, they're technically speaking, those are ladybird eggs. They might be what we would call ladybug. They're in that family, and uh, I'll, I'll give you a hint a little bit later on during this this particular stream about how to tell the difference. You won't be able to tell the difference for sure until the adult form emerges, at least from my experience, because sometimes uh, colorations can be different. Uh, no. That is not a potato be beetle. <laughs> Second picture is ladybug eggs. Yes. The third picture is the larva form of a ladybug. And the last one is the pupa form of a ladybug or a lady beetle. Kill it with fire, David says. Kill it with fire. <laughs> um, and you may not be able to tell for sure until they're mature, until you've got that full, fully formed ladybug out. And what, what's the big deal? What's the difference? Um, a lot of people consider ladybugs to be pests, but there's a difference between ladybugs. We've got the native ones around here, which are almost completely red. And there's an import that came over from Asia, an Asian ladybug, Asian ladybird beetle, also called a harlequin. And the harlequins like to invade your homes come October or November or so, whenever it starts getting getting cold, they come inside. They have been known to bite people occasionally. So people are a little bit concerned with these bugs invading their homes. I'm going to be showing tonight or Wednesday. I can't remember which. No, it's going to be next Wednesday. I'll be showing another bug that likes to invade people's homes in the fall That uh, that's a bit of a pest. If not really so much a pest in the garden, but a pest that likes to come into your house and make a mess. Um, ladybirds are terrible. Well, yes and no. They do the same things as the ladybug in the garden, as far as going out and hunting down, uh, going out and hunting down other insects, aphids, and other insects, stink beetles, and things of that nature. So there are predators in the garden, but they're pests in the home whenever they come inside. Uh, the easiest way to tell that I know of that you've got a harlequin as opposed to a regular ladybug is if you take a look at the front end of it, um, you've got the abdomen, that's the wide part in the back, and then you've got the thorax, which is just the head of the abdomen, and then finally you've got the head all the way at the end, three different parts of an insect, abdomen, thorax, and the head is at the, at the very end. The thorax portion, if you have a look at it, it may look like you have an M or a W design on the thorax. And if you see an M or a W design on the thorax, you're looking at a ladybird or a harlequin and not one of the, the nicer ladybugs. But if they're not coming into your home, if they're busy killing off pests in your garden, I'm inclined to, to let them go. 
They seem to destroy your squash and pumpkin plants. Really? Well, if they're destroying your squash and pumpkin plants, you might want to do something about them. Or they may not be ladybugs at all. Carry the bugs outside after you get a picture. Or, or you, you can vacuum them up as well if they're inside the house. You can suck them all up. All right, let's get back over here to that. That, of course, is the pupa. And to be perfectly honest, I think that probably is a harlequin. It's a lot on the orange side. And I don't know, it, it could be. It could be a ladybug, but it's probably a harlequin. All right, I'm going to talk about my granddad a little bit. My granddad died of cancer in 1973. I was two years old that year. I believe I may have mentioned before that my grandpa was involved in the permaculture movement early on. It was well before the movement got started, really. But he was a vegetable farmer. And like everyone else at the time, that meant riding around on the tractor and spraying chemicals. He had a farm that was over 90 acres. Uh, Ten of it was involved in infrastructure, and about 80 of it was production farm, growing corn and beans and squash and tomatoes, cucumbers and onions and everything else under the sun. Um, they would call it a uh, a market garden in, in modern parlance, but they called it a truck farm back then. This was in the, the 1930s. Well, he died of cancer in 1973, lung cancer. And a man dying of lung cancer at the age of 74 might not sound so significant, at least, well, not today. But Carol Conrad was a member of a family noted for their longevity, and he never smoked. So could the pesticides that he was inhaling day after day while riding around on that tractor have contributed to his early demise? Oh, those of us in the, in the family like to think so, uh, but we don't really have any proof one way or the other. But I don't relish the idea personally of dying of cancer at a young age, and maybe you share that sentiment. And if so, here's some ways to use nature to deal with pests. Uh, we're going to be talking about roles here. Number one, role other than producing fertility for your garden is wildlife attraction. So the photos that we're looking at above, you saw the, you saw that allium flower, you saw the ape and saw the ants. Um, you saw the, the, the either ladybug or ladybird beetle, and we're not really sure at the moment which one it was. Either way, that insect, whenever it, whenever it emerges as a larva and whenever it emerges as an adult, are going to be busy killing aphids. They can consume up to 50 a day. Now, here's a fun fact. Not all aphids are green. There are some black ones, and the black ones tend to emerge earlier in the season. Incidentally, I picked this up from um, Michael Phillips. It is Michael Phillips. Anyway, they're attracted to plants like the stinging nettle. Stinging nettle, incidentally, are great accumulators of potassium, calcium, magnesium, and are right up there with the mulberry when it comes to accumulating sulfur. I didn't mention it earlier in dynamic accumulators because I wanted to mention it at this point. Uh, they aren't rich in vit or sorry, they are. They are rich in vitamin C as well. So if those sort of things are important to you, uh, you might want to have some stinging nettle in your garden plant. Uh, if you aren't spraying pesticides and you have stinging nettles, those black aphids are likely to come along and start snacking. And that's going to attract the predator species that loves to munch on aphids, which is of course the, the lady beetle, the ladybugs. So that's a picture here of a stinging nettle and a couple of ladybugs making more ladybugs on the stinging nettle. But the idea behind this is if you have an attractor plant out there that you may not necessarily care so much about whether or not it gets nibbled on a little bit, it's going to provide the opportunity for the pest to appear on that plant so it serves as a trap for one. And two, if you're not spraying, gives an opportunity for your predators, in this case, those ladybugs, to get started reproducing, eating aphids, growing their numbers, so that later on when the things that you do care about start coming in, you've already got a force of predators ready to get to, get to work eliminating your pest problems for you. And let's leave that lovely picture there. We'll take a look at our comments. Hickory Croft Farm said, Asian lady beetle, Harmonia 
unpronounceable Latin. <laughs> yes, harmonious. Okay. Yeah, somebody brought them in thinking that they were they were going to be helpful for eliminating pests, agricultural pests, and they just took off. Now, there's a lot of stories like that where, where people have, have thought that they were doing something useful. Um, Johnson, Johnson grass started out in Turkey originally, and then I think it was in the 1800s. Somebody brought it in and imported it to Alabama to stabilize a riverbank, and then it spread from there. And now it's all over the place. And Johnson grass is a kind of sorghum. It's a wild sorghum, but it's not the best kind of sorghum that you could be planting. The seeds are tiny. The uh... Do you guys see the chair move behind me? <sighs> Do we have a ghost? No, we've got a kitty. Hi, kitty. <laughs> I've got a kitty down here. Um, the, the the grass produces sugar inside the stem, so you could cut it back and and, and ferment it for for uh, for alcohol if you wanted to. But it's not as good as regular sorghum would be. It's not as good as a grain sorghum. It's not as good as a as a sugar sorghum. But we're stuck with it now, and I don't think there's any getting rid of it. Uh, burn it with fire, David might say, and I think I probably agree with him. Turn it over. Burn it with fire. Turn it over again. Burn it with fire. Maybe one day we can root it out. Uh, occultation seems to work pretty good if you have the ability to cover an area and keep it covered during the time period that those seeds will sprout and grow up and that the Johnson grass wants to grow up from the roots. Occultation will stop it and you can interrupt the life cycle. But it has a lot of starch in those roots, so it has a lot of oomph. It can outlast a lot of things just by sitting waiting in the ground to, to have its chance to grow up again. Kudzu is another example, something that was imported thinking, hey, it's going to do some good as a ground cover, and that just takes off and takes over. Yeah, the native ladybug in North America is good. The Asian lady be ladybird beetle, yeah, it's a mixed bag. It can do some good, but it can do a lot of harm, too. Uh, coming up on Wednesday, I've got a a presentation which hopefully won't take more than two hours. <clears throat> uh, there's a lot of stuff to cover uh, on next Wednesday's presentation about predators and prey species and uh, some of the ones that are somewhat beneficial are also somewhat harmful and there's sort of a gate that you have to negotiate if you're going to be using this them successfully. Carl says, David the Good, you got that right? I wish they would leave their fingers out of things. Amen. Leave their fingers out of a whole lot of things. Let me see here. Got ahead of myself. So Hickercroft Farm says having some knowledge of the plants and animal species that are present, natives, natives, et cetera, is a great skill for any gardener or homesteader. Absolutely. These are things that really should be common knowledge for all of us. I wish they were teaching a lot of this stuff at school instead of teaching kids how to finger paint. David says about 85 million kudzu plants were given to southern landowners by the Soil Erosion Service for land revitalization and to reduce soil erosion and add nitrogen to the soil. Yeah, kudzu is a pioneer species. <laughs> it's a it's a galloping pioneer, but I wouldn't recommend anybody plant it. But if you're stuck with a lot of it, uh, the, the the good news is you can chop it and drop it. It's it's a it's a, a great accumulator, good for mulch, good for fodder. We can eat it too. It's edible for us. So solution to kudzu: eat it, cut it down, feed it to everything, and uh, then replace it with stuff that won't take over. Uh, let's see, $8 per acre is what the government offered as an incentive for farmers to plant their land in kudzu. Oh, Lord. It's insane. Talk about a waste of money.
And apparently, yeah, the Japanese beetles are already up there and have been up there since the 80s, according to cliffside permaculture. Biggest problem there is knotweed. We have to do a we have to do a video about knotweed, cliffside. Let's see. Okay, David's cutting and pasting here, I think. <laughs> During the 1930s and 40s, Kogan grass was introduced into Florida for soil stabilization purposes. Is that from one of your books, incidentally, David? <laughs> However, it was found to be of little economic benefit for it and potentially a serious pest. Uh, one of my most hated weeds. Yeah. Unturf with Russell Balestrini says, I'm building software to sell plants and seeds online. Anyone interested? I'm sure quite a few people may be interested in that. Um, if you've got some uh, some stuff on your on your channel about that software or another website that, uh, that you want to tell us about, I'd be happy to check it out. Um, currently, I'm building an online plant nursery, which is turning out to be an interesting experience. <laughs> <laughs> I'm encountering challenges I never knew were challenges before. Just navigating how to set this thing up. You can see why not everybody is doing it. Hello, Homer, microfarmer. Is Homer up in Connecticut? Let's see. So Japanese knotweed is edible when young. Okay. That's cool. Twelve foot tap. Wow. 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 That's a that's a deep tapper. If it wasn't such a problem, that would be a wonderful thing. <laughs> Here, let's go down. Let's mine some minerals. Bring them up to the surface. But if you can't keep up with the with its, its rate of propagation, then it's yeah, it's a pain. All right, let's head on back in. Look at some more stuff. More stuff. Of course, there's a lot of plants that attract wildlife. I could spend a few hours talking about them, but we've been on for about 45 minutes already, so I think we'll just move on. How about another role? Insect repellent. Strongly aromatic plants can con confuse pest insects, making it difficult to, for them to home in on the pheromonic scent of their favorite meal. Uh, for example, marigolds. That's a fairly popular garden companion, as is basil. I like to plant basil next to my tomatoes. Um, two of my personal favorites are peppermint and lavender coming soon to an online nursery unit near you. $3.99 each, four for $15 or eight for $25 plus shipping and handling. These plants are shipped in biodegradable, recyclable cardboard bus. Just tear the cardboard off and use it for mulch when you plug that little herb into your garden. Quick, convenient, environmentally friendly, <coughs> shameless plug um, for upcoming <laughs> products from our website. <laughs> But aside from being absolutely essential for making a proper mojito, peppermint is good for deterring vine borer moths, the oil. Uh, if you make a decoction of the leaves and spray that around your plants, you might be able to get away with planting it right next to the base of your of your squash and uh, help keep the vine borer from finding its uh, its place to put its little eggs. Uh, lavender also has a scent molecule that binds with the scent receptors of mosquitoes that reduces their ability to locate you, which is kind of cool. So as long as I'm thinking about mosquitoes, uh, Here's a couple more tidbits on those obnoxious little pests. And I'll talk about this a little bit more next week. But first off, did you know they aren't pests? Mosquitoes, they're not pests. The primary diet of the mosquito is nectar, particularly nectar from evening and night blooming flowers, some of which might never be pollinated at all, at all if not for those adorable little critters. So when you wear perfumes that smell like flowers and you wear bright colors, you're advertising to the mosquitoes, Here's a flower, come drink me. But it's only the females that are drinking the blood. And then it's only enough to get the protein that she needs to form her eggs. So plant lavender along your walkway so that whenever you walk next to it, it brushes against you, gets off on your skin. Those, those oils get off on your skin. And on your guests, whenever they're walking by, they get a little bit of that lavender oil on them and wear darker colors, avoid floral scents. And poor mama mosquito will just have to have some other source for her meal. And I'm going to 
scroll to this little picture here and leave it right there. And uh, we'll have a look at comments and see what's going on. I know somebody's going to disagree with me that mosquitoes aren't pests. <laughs> Uh, William Demke says, where are you located? I am in northeastern Oklahoma, just west of Tulsa, Oklahoma. That's why we call it Green Country Agroforestry, because this part of the, the state has been designated by the Oklahoma Bureau of Tourism as Green Country. Sounds a lot better than land recently reclaimed from the Dust Bowl. And yeah, it's, it's in Zone 7A. John says, dumb question, what is knotweed? That's not a dumb question. I personally am not incredibly familiar with knotweed, but Cliffside Permaculture can tell us all about it, I'll bet. That's cool, though. First plant to break through new lava flows. That's a hardy plant. Boo. Mary keeps on wearing, okay, Mary is Tulsa Fox. That's the missus. She keeps on wearing bright colored clothes. She keeps on wearing floral scents and she keeps on getting eaten by mosquitoes. So <laughs> I walk out and I'm wearing, this is about as light as I get, this gray. And uh, I don't smell like flowers and I very rarely ever have one try to try to, to suck my blood. Um. Depending upon where you are, songbirds are usually the most common thing on a mosquito's menu for blood, says so Hickory Croft Farm. Yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll find other places to get a meal other than you if you don't attract them. All right. Does anybody, anybody else want to tell me I'm full of it by saying that mosquitoes aren't pests? <laughs> but their primary role. Hello, Amy at Cray's Family Homestead. It's Amy. She's just down south of us. Not all the way down south in Texas, but just down south. All right, let's get back to it. I got this plant here on the screen. Does anybody know what this plant is? I'll take a minute. You can put some guesses in. Remember I was talking about mosquitoes being attracted to particularly evening and night blooming flowers? I'll give you a hint, this one likes to bloom in the evening. So I hit my vaporizer and drink my coffee. David, you're not allowed to answer. You already know what this plant is. I know you do. <laughs> this is a Nicotina sylvestris, a woodland tobacco. It's a perennial tobacco. And uh, it likes to bloom in the evening. It has a very, very nice scent. And you can tell from looking at the way that the flower is constructed, if you're a butterfly or a hummingbird or anything of that nature, you need a really long tongue to get down in there to get to the nectar. Or if you're a mosquito, you can crawl inside and look at where those reproductive parts of the flower are. Notice it's bright. Flowering tobaccos, ornamental flowering tobacco, tobaccos typically have bright white or pink flowers as opposed to the, the commercially grown tobacco. Some of those have colorful flowers too, but most commercial tobaccos that I know of have, have sort of a light green flower. But these are bright. They're attractive. They're drawing in those evening pollinators. So here's a plan. You get yourself some night flowering tobacco. You plant it someplace in your garden away, far, far away from where everybody's going to be gathering, not next to your patio. You've got lavender leading up to your patio. Far away from your patio where nobody's going to be gathering in the evening, you've got your flowering tobacco or some other night flowering plant. It's going to produce that scent. It's going to have the flowers open. It's going to say, hi, I'm here. I'm a flower. Come drink from me. And the mosquito is going to be confused about where the people are over here and go wander over there to where the, that, that nice scent is, the scent that they like, and investigate that instead. So that is a way that you can draw the pests away from you and put them to work doing the thing that they're supposed to be doing in your garden, which is pollinating. Of course, if you're growing something like Nicotina sylvestris, you can use it as a pesticide, but please, please, please be careful because the nicotine can be 
lethal to beneficial insects as well. So last resort, you might possibly, if nothing else is working, use this as a spot treatment for troublesome pests. Don't make this your primary source of dealing with pests. Okay, so Nicotina sylvestris is a perennial. USDA hardness zone six through nine, UK hard, cold hardy to zone seven. We don't have any growing right now, but um, sometime in the future, if I can work out the, the, the legal stuff to make it available at the nursery, I'll make it available. I, I, I plan to have some growing for my own personal use. And if I can't, uh, through the, the website that I'm currently using, set it up or set up a method of, of commercializing it, um, I'll at least provide a, a link to somebody that does have it that you can get it from. Uh, there are some countries that will not allow you to sell a perennial ornamental flowering tobacco. It's odd because those same countries allow you to have foxglove, which is just lethal, and morning glory and rhododendrons, both of which have hallucinogenic properties. Do we have time to talk about mad honey and uh, Brianna toxin poisoning? No, probably not. Um, let's just move on for now. What's this? Anybody know what this plant is? Up here. <laughs> they catch up with our with our comments. Uh, yeah, zones. Okay, so William Dimko is over there in Zone Seven A. That's the same place where uh, James Prigioni is is at. Incidentally, yeah, I watch his stuff too. <laughs> but that's in New Jersey. Uh, mosquitoes aren't native. Really, you tell. Amy says mosquitoes are pests. She'll say it. <laughs> it's okay to say it. Conrad Homestead, Paul is saying they're cr crushing basil and rubbing on bare skin to repel mosquitoes. You can also eat a clove of garlic a day. One clove of garlic a day keeps the mosquitoes away. Incidentally, if you want one clove of garlic a day, you're going to need about 30 to 34 bulbs of garlic for your yearly supply. So you only supply 30, 30 to 34 bulbs of garlic. Get you a guarantee of one clove a day. Keep the doctor away and keep the bugs away too. Uh, we're growing some long neck uh, or hard neck variety garlic right now. But we won't have enough for sale. Not this year anyway. We're, we'll, we'll build up our stock. We'll have more in the future. The death lily. Night blooming death lily. <laughs> yes, David's in here. We are not worthy. We're not worthy. For those that don't know, uh, David the Good is an author, uh, YouTube content creator, big, big channel. Well, eh, fairly large. Okay, he's got a few subscribers, <laughs> but excellent, excellent to watch. He has a website called thesurvivalgardener.com, thesurvivalgardener.com. If you're interested at all in growing food that you can live on, I would highly, highly, highly recommend that you check out the survivalgardener.com and follow his YouTube channel. And you'll find his a link for his YouTube channel uh, on my channel homepage in uh, the featured channels list. <laughs> no king but Jesus, he says. Cliffside Permaculture is saying, is woodland tobacco a regulated plant like regular tobacco? In some places, yes. In some places. Not necessarily in the United States. In the United States, you can get tobacco seeds in most states that I'm aware of. There might be some that you can't. I'll have to double check that list. Um, Mary is asking if I ever got that to grow. I have managed to get Virginia gold tobacco to sprout, but I... Didn't get it much further than sprouting, but there were things that I didn't know whenever I tried it. Um, things that I just didn't know. And <laughs> since, since I have started watching the David the Good channel, I know a lot more about prop propagating tobacco than I knew before, and I'm ready to give it another try. Let me see. 
Some states have that regulation, Pennsylvania, okay. Uh, as far as the, the plant that I showed in the next picture here, Crace Family Homestead has it. Amy, you are correct, that is bee balm. Joey Oaks has the proper genus name, it is Menarda, that's correct. Elmo vine. <laughs> Bee balm Monarda says cliffside permaculture. Move on, he says. Eating garlic also repels the opposite sex. Yes, uh, well, I don't know. If you're both eating garlic, it's, it's not really repellent, is it? All right. Castle Highs, Brian says, hey, Jason, hey, Castle Highs. 132 garlic planted. That's cool. <laughs> Connor at home says, says creating new YouTube accounts have to subscribe to Jason. <laughs> We're getting really, really close to the uh to the 900 sub purge. So it's going to be interesting to see how many people are only watching because they want to find out if I'm going to show them how to make black powder or not. Incidentally, I'm not going to show you how to make black powder. I will show you how to get your own source of potassium nitrate. Uh, independent of any supply chain, which has got to be fun. Um, and if you want to use that for some purpose other than fertilizing your garden, then that's entirely on you. Three hundred planted this year. Last year, I planted around six hundred garlic, but they didn't turn out so well because I was doing some experimentation. I was seeing how close I could get them together and get away with it. It turns out not that close. Six to eight inches should be about the, the right spacing. I currently don't have the tobacco seeds. Stump removal. Yeah. Here's your here's your 1.2 second stump removal. <laughs> or, oh yeah, applying it directly. Although my preferred method to remove stumps would be to take a hand auger and get, get that augered out and then go grab yourself some of your... Uh, some of your inoculum from your garden with your um, King Strafaria spawn in it or your, your oyster mushroom spawn in it and work that into the holes and then just let the mushrooms eat up the stump. <laughs> or Tannerite, says Brian. <laughs> that one, actually, you're close. It looks an awful lot like the uh, the fistulosa. That one is a, uh, is a bergamot bee bomb. It's a little bit more dark red. Let me go ahead and get back to that picture. It's a little bit more dark red than the than the fistulosa. Fistulosa is often called Oswego tea, and it's a little bit lighter in shade. But you're going to see some variation in hue depending upon. Can anybody guess what? What will make the the shade lighter or darker of the flower, not of the not of the foliage? Differences in your phosphorus content in your soil will make, make your flowers either darker or lighter. And that's that applies to different flowers. But this one's a bergamot, a bergamot bee balm. But it looks exactly the same as the fistulosa. Just has a, a little bit different flavor, a little bit different scent. All of the Menarda have potent scents that draw pollinators in like mad. Um, the bergamot bee balm does actually smell like the, the bergamot oil that goes to make uh, Earl Grey tea. But another thing that all of these plants have in common is a high amount of a chemical compound called thymol. Thymol can also be found in thyme, no surprise there. And it's very, very concentrated in oregano. Um, did I mention we're growing Greek oregano in the nursery as well? <coughs> Shameless plug. Um, the potency of fresh oregano and the essential oil is such that it can not only stop the pain of a toothache whenever you apply it directly to the source, but the antiseptic properties of the thymol make short work of the bacterial infection that's causing the pain in the first place. Thymol is one of the four active ingredients, four, four active ingredients that you find in that popular antiseptic mouthwash Listerine. The others are menthol, which is derived from mint. We are growing peppermint as well in the nursery, available for sale sometime soon. Methyl salicate, which is the oil of wintergreen, which is not going to be available this year, but maybe next year or the year after I'll have wintergreen available for sale. And eucalyptol, which I probably will never have for sale because I just don't live in the right climate to grow it. 
<laughs> which, of course, eucalypto comes from leek eucalyptus. You have to get that from somewhere else. Unless I set up a, uh, unless I set up a greenhouse that allows me to, to bump my zone up considerably and have room for the tree. Uh, we should have at least one variety of Monarda available by next year, uh, hopefully more than one, because I, I'd like to have a variation. I'd like to have some blue stocking, which has a more purple flower, and I'd like to have that bergamot Monarda available. One of these days, probably not anytime in the next year or two, but one of these days, we'll have essential oils of lavender, oregano, peppermint, and wintergreen available. Uh, if not from Green Country Agroforestry's website, uh, we're planning on launching a second business called Happy Bear Farms, and they'll carry those. Uh, ultimately, the idea here is I, I'll use Green Country Agroforestry as the, the land management company. We'll purchase the property. We'll do all the necessary improvements to it and turn it into a turnkey operation where someone else can come in, walk onto the property, and take over the production of agroforestry products from the property. So your oil of winter greens, your, your nuts, berries, fruits, everything else that comes from it, and market those products as a commercial business. Um, my daughter will most likely be taking over Happy Bear Farms, and who knows, maybe more to come after that. I don't know. We'll see. Before we go on, there's another picture here, and maybe somebody can guess what this particular tree is. This is a tree. It's a tree. Let me see here. Amy says she stops counting her garlic once she hits 20. But you have so many people to eat garlic. You need more than 20. Beets using diesel, yeah. Yeah, if you, if you want to get rid of a tree, you can cut it down and paint the stump with diesel and it, it won't come back. It's not the nicest way to get rid of a tree. Uh, watch hours. Conrad Holmes says, asking how many watch hours. The last time I checked, we were at 3,914.7. So we're, 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 we're keeping a pretty good pace with, with subscribers and watch hours, which tells me I'm probably doing something right. <laughs> I know a lot of people have, uh, have difficulty. They'll either get a lot of views and a lot of subscribers and not many watch hours, or, uh, usually that's, that's, that's the big problem is. Not enough watch hours. Amy has some bee bomb with horrible cases of powdery mildew. Aw. So powdery mildew. Uh, you really have to look at look and see what's going on there. Is there enough airflow in the area where the, where the bee bomb is? Um, is the bee bomb getting powdery mildew early on, or is it later on in the life cycle? Later on in the life cycle, whenever the plant's getting ready to die off, powdery mildew might be the thing that ultimately takes it down. And that's part of the circle of life. But if it's if it's becoming a problem and killing the plant off early, that may be something you want to look at, see if you can get rid of it. Um, baking soda and water mixed together, sprayed on the leaves to neutralize pH may make it difficult for powdery mildew to survive. Unturf says, I start joking with my wife that if I keep replanting most of my garlic for the next three years, we'll need to take out insurance on the crop. Hey, uh, an overabundance of, of, of something that you can sell at anywhere from, from a buck to, to eat as much as, wow, I've seen it go for $3 a bulb. That's, uh, that's a good problem to have. <laughs> Just make sure you're putting sulfur back into the soil. All right, so Cliffside Permaculture has a recommendation. I've heard that if you harvest right after, the flowering, the Monarda will hold off from getting mildew. That'd be nice for longer. So, yeah, um, mildew likes to come in. Powdery mildew ordinarily likes to come in close to a plant's, the end of a plant's life cycle. And it's all, the only thing it's doing there, if it's, if it's serving its purpose, is getting rid of that plant, clearing it out of the way to make room for something else to grow. 
And Cliffside Permaculture nailed it. Yes, that's an alder tree. <laughs> 3,914.7. Who's counting? <laughs> Me. <laughs> I look at it every day. We're almost there. We're almost there. I'm so excited. We're almost there. I really don't know how much. Okay, Chris, Chris Family Home said is asking how much sulfur for onions and garlic. I really don't know exactly how much sulfur. I wish I did, but I couldn't tell you as far as precise quantities of sulfur. Um, I will search and try to provide that information if I can find it at some future date. Off the top of my head, I don't know exactly how much they need. Some. <laughs> some. That's all I know. If you're doing taste tests on your on your alliums and they seem to be losing potency, it would be an indication you're depleting your amount of sulfur. Okay, let's get back over here. We're a little bit past an hour. And I've got oh, we're almost done. Hey, look at that. So yes, that's it. That's an alder tree. Specifically, this one is a is a black alder. Uh a a Alnus glutinosa, European black alder. I have one of these. I may be getting some uh, some more native varieties of alder tree. Hopefully, one that I can ship out to some places in the country where this tree is listed as an invasive. Uh, incidentally, the European black alder is listed as invasive in Wisconsin. I'm sorry, Carl. It's on the list. No, it, it's not just on the list in Wisconsin. It's illegal to sell this tree in Wisconsin illegal you can't have them no no black alder for you and in i want to say delaware rhode island let me see maryland it's in maryland it's listed as invasive invasive in maryland other places in the country if it is listed as invasive it's only on a county by county basis and i have not been able to determine which if any counties it's listed that way as but uh Cannot sell it at all in in Wisconsin, and Maryland won't let you grow it in a nursery in Maryland. Other than that, as far as I know, everybody else can have these. So it's a fast-growing biomass producer. That's another role, biomass producers. So if you're looking for something that you can grow to get your carbon to feed your compost pile with, to put down as mulch, a um, number of other different purposes you might need biomass for example um you need a medium hardwood for growing mushrooms like turkey tails reishi amadou that's the three mushroom and a cancer medicinal blend by the way shiitake mushrooms and okatakis oyster mushrooms wine cat mushrooms and more i think namaco also would grow on medium hardwood uh, namaco is one of the mushrooms that goes into making uh, miso soup if you're interested in japanese food the seed cones that you see in the picture are a natural but gentle means of lowering pH, and as such, they're highly prized for aquarium enthusiasts. So if you have an alder tree and you're collecting those cones after you get your seeds to propagate more trees with, incidentally, propagating trees, propagation in general, there's a book that David wrote called Free Plants for Everyone, available on Amazon.com. Uh, easy to read. I recommend getting it. <laughs> uh, Take those cones, put them up for sale uh, at your Etsy store, and you might be surprised at how many people will be willing to buy your alder cones from you just to put into their aquariums to alter the pH. There's a powder that's made from the inner bark of the alder tree combined with oil of wintergreen and maybe a low abrasive like sodium bicarbonate that makes a great toothpaste, incidentally. Um, you'd be surprised at the market there is for some of these odd out of the way products. Um, it's not really well known here in the United States, but uh, we will eventually have a toothpaste product available made from older tree, oil of wintergreen, a little bit of a sodium bicarb. So um, the other reuse for having an alder tree, it forms mycorrhizal associations with both our muscular and ectomycorrhizal fungi. So if you're growing your nut trees and you're growing your fruit trees in the same system, having a bridge species like the alder may help you form a mutual network. I'm not going to guarantee that it's going to help you form a, net, a mutual network, but without it, you're not going to have a mutual network. 
All right, uh, I think we've gone on long enough. Uh, there's plenty of other examples and probably a few more roles that various plants play in the design of a permaculture system, but hopefully the few that I mentioned today will give you some inspiration to start thinking about what you could be growing in your own woodland garden. Woodland garden, I can't talk. And of course, this entire blog post is available at our website at greencountryagroforestry.com. I know a few of you have already read it. Let me just go ahead and go back to our initial picture there and catch up with you guys. Okay. Conrad says, uh, Cliffside, you need to find your channel. Uh, if somebody has, um, if somebody has some um, some moderator powers, go ahead and put up the links for uh, Cliffside Permaculture. She's doing some awesome stuff. Okay, so Carl, you're just saying you have alder trees already. You already have lots of them. So I don't know why. I don't know why uh, Wisconsin is making them them. them Illegal, or maybe that maybe that 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 database is out of date. I don't know. <laughs> Amy says, "Speaking of propagating trees, my daughter daughter threw away my apple seeds yesterday. I forgave her, but man, I can relate. I can relate. I had uh, I had about fifteen or twenty pears in the refrigerator that I was saving for the seeds last year. No, not last year. Year before last, and Mary did a refrigerator cleaning." And threw them all away. Then I told her, Mary, or asked her, Mary, do you know what happened to the pears that I had in there? You know, the nice squishy ones full of seeds that I was going to plant and get started on having my root stocks for my double grafted pear trees, which will sell for around 35 bucks a piece whenever they're grown after two years after I get them started. And she said, What? <laughs> Mary, <laughs> Mary, you just threw our money away. <laughs> I forgive her, but man, I would love to have those. Uh, I would love to have those grafts setting right now. It'd be great. So, Cliffside Permaculture says I use the pole wood from fast growing trees like this for cross braces on my low cost terracing. Absolutely, yeah. All right, building wood, uh, biomass, fodder for your mushrooms, carbon for your for your composting. You get our own separate fridges for just this sort of thing. Mary just was talking about having a separate fridge, incidentally. <laughs> yeah. Fridge downstairs could sell the seeds for stratifying. Yeah, right now I've got lavender stratifying in the regular in the regular fridge. I don't think I have to worry about Mary finding my lavender seeds and throwing those out because they're they're clearly labeled. So it's my best interest to figure out how to multiply my mulberry plants for the garlic cash crop. Yeah, you can just plant a lot of mulberry seeds. I believe they require some scarification and stratification, but don't take my word for it. Look into it. You should be able to get mulberry seeds started fairly easily. And then, yeah, grow your mulberries. You got mulberries that you can eat while the while the while the plants are growing. You can always prune them, keep them small. So you can reach the fruit. If you let the trees get big like our mulberry trees are, you're probably never going to see any of the fruit from them because the birds will eat it all. Then again, uh, having birds around eating your mulberries, if they're busy eating your mulberries, they're not busy eating your blueberries and your cherries. So I guess that's a benefit. And you have the birds around to eat your insects. They may, be, may have been attracted by the fruit, but they're going to stay for the stay for the bugs. Gonna try some red mulberry seeds, see how it goes. Awesome. At some point in the future, I'll probably try to get some berries out there. I don't uh we'll see how much space I have. As I said before, right now my problem with mulberries is although we have two large trees, the fruit's way up here where it's out of my reach, unless I get up on a stepladder and the birds get to it before I do. But if you're growing them for uh for for the mulch and for the fodder. You can keep them short, keep them, you know, head height, maybe 12 feet tops. So you can reach up, pull them down, print it off, strip the leaves off, 
drop that down there where your garlic is growing and, and feed your garlic. Cuttings of mulberry. I'll have to look into, into growing mulberry from cuttings. The local feed and seed store, they experience a shortage in getting trees and seeds. Hmm. Oh, well, well. Uh, at some point in the future, I need to update the website and throw in uh, a segment a segment in on resources and uh, provide some links to some other nurseries and other channels and other endeavors where you can get more information and, of course, more sources to get things because, you know, people sell out. Um, are there any other questions, comments, complaints? Ooh, ah, I don't need to do it right now. I was, was going to show you what's in this box if anybody's interested, but we're already past an hour. We are in Zone Seven A, Joshua Campbell. Zone Seven A. Of course, I would recommend that people go and look at our other blog posts. There's some very interesting ones in there as well, uh, other than just the ones that I do a show on. I try to post every other day or so. Uh, <laughs> Amy wants to see what's in the box. What's in the box? What's in the box? Sometimes. Sometimes things show up in the mail here. Sometimes I have no idea what's showing up in the mail because Mary orders them. And Mary doesn't tell me what she's ordered. Sometimes she will tell me what she's ordered, but not always. Most of the time when she tells me what she's ordered, I immediately forget what she said it was. And so whenever the box shows up, I don't know what's in it. Occasionally I wait until I'm doing a live stream to open the box. In this particular case, I know what's in here. This is an order from another nursery because I had a desire to add a particular type of bush that I don't already have. Well, actually I do. I have an example of this genre of this genera already. I've got about seven, six or seven plants of the vaccinium, vaccinium, vaccinium genus, but I didn't have these particular species. So these are a grand total of eight rabbit eyes blueberries. Eight of them. So I will be able to provide at some point in the future rabbit eyes Blueberries, which are a long-lived southern highbush variety. We've got specifically Teeth Blue and Climax cultivars. So, blueberries, yeah. I've got that, that project going on where I'm going to try to get blueberries to grow in the shade of a pecan tree. We'll see how that works out. Where? Oh, no, she didn't order these. I ordered these. I ordered these. But I got permission first. I, Keep this in mind, folks. If you have a significant other, always check with significant other before making big purchases of lots of seeds and trees. Otherwise, they may get upset with you. But I talked to Mary, and she said, yes, go ahead. Order a whole bunch of stuff. And I said, okay, how much can I order? And she said, well, how much do you want? And I said, ooh, <laughs> okay. So we have a lot of stuff coming this year. The rabbit eyes, blue, rabbit eyes blueberries are one of them. Um, we got these delivered from this company out in Georgia called Willis Orchards. And they are a bit more expensive than I probably will sell them for. You want it all. Unterfit with Russell Ballastrini says all of it. I want all of it. Yes, me too. I want them all. I want everything I can. I want to have every square 
inch of, 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 of surface on this property. It's a third of an acre altogether. I want every square inch that can be photosizing to be uh, photosynthesizing to be photosynthesizing. If it's not canopy, it'll be understory. If it's not understory, it'll be a shrub layer. If it's not shrub layer, it'll be herbaceous. If it's not herbaceous, it'll be ground cover. And possibly by the time we get down to ground cover, I'm going to be looking for things that really, really like shade. <laughs> When I have plants available, I'm thinking $7.99 for, for blueberries. I'm thinking $7.99. We'll see. Um, but who knows? With inflation going the way it is, it might be $450 by then. And then, you know, going up by afternoon. The way things are going, <laughs> you never know. Um, yeah, start, start planning. Start planning. Start planning. Think about what you want to grow. Uh, put together your design. What, what, are you, what are you designing for? What do you want? Uh, are you wanting to grow just a beautiful garden? Okay, well, that's, that, that, that's a goal. Do you want to have food? Uh, what kind of food do you want to grow? Primarily, you're, you're looking for staple crops, things that you can live on, things that will keep you alive, then you're looking at lots of nuts trees. Fruit trees are great. Fruit trees are great. But if you're growing nothing but fruit trees, I don't know how many cans of peaches or pears you can get into before you finally put the fork down and go, man, I would trade all of this for a good juicy steak. So nut trees are good. Don't have time to grow pecans. Well, you know, they, are, they do take a long time to produce. 15 years after you plant a pecan tree, you can expect maybe 50 pounds a year. That's 50 days worth of food. But hazelnut trees grow all the way down into zone nine, and those will be producing within two or three years, four years, perhaps, nine years by the time they're in full swing. So those are a great thing to look into. They can grow in shade, or at least partial shade. So if you've got big canopy stuff, your big fruit tree, your big uh, your big pecan tree, your big walnut tree. Well, I don't know about walnuts and, and hazelnuts. They may not get along well together. But your big trees, and then you've got your, your your smaller trees, your hazelnuts underneath that. Have a few fruit trees. You can always can fruit. You can always dry fruit. You can always make uh, you can always make uh, a, a cider or preserves out of out of fruit. Uh, and Hickory Croft Farm can eat a lot of peaches. I can too. I really can. Um, Mary is saying, I think hazelnuts are low key to the future. Just saying, I think they really are. Um, USDA zones four through nine in the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere covers a lot of space. And incidentally, um, there are hazelnut tree cultivars that can grow in zone three as well, and possibly as high as zone two or as low as zone two, depending upon whether you're in North or South Hemisphere. Um, since I don't have them available for sale right now, check out um, New Forest at New Forest Farm uh, Forest Agriculture Enterprises. I think it's called Forag is the website. Forag.com. Uh, that is Mark Shepard's nursery, and he is selling hazelnuts at $5 a tree, but you have to buy bundles of 25. If that's too many trees for you, you can always go in hazies with a neighbor, order up, order up a bundle and split them. Although, if we're looking for feeding a person, I'd say around 15 hazelnut trees per person is a good number. If, they, if you want them to provide all the, all the calories and proteins that a, that a, that a growing boy needs, um, 15 hazelnuts per person would be great. And you can plant those and have those growing and have those already producing by the time your, your big trees are ready to start producing. And yes, Cliffside uh, Permaculture ordered some up from Mark Shepard. Yep, yep. Another, he, he, I don't, as far as I know, Mark does not have a YouTube channel, but you can, you can search for Mark Shepard and see a lot of speaking events where Mark has, has appeared. And he does like to just hammer you with that fire hose of information. You'll 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 finish with your head spinning, but you'll know ten times more than you know now. And he is using permaculture and growing for profit. He's got no interest in in, in small plots in people's backyards. Although he, he won't you know tell you not to. <laughs> He's primarily interested in growing for a profit, and he is making a profit growing with permaculture. Uh, do I have a link? Uh, yes, I do. Hang on a second. I do have a link. I have several links. Let's see. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? 
here it is. Forest, Forest Agriculture Enterprises. This, let me post it here. Okay, Paul is asking for a Jugalone friendly list of plants. I will work on that and get that available to, to us very soon and have that available. There are lists out there. If you do Google, Google searches, you can find lists. But uh, yeah, the more places you can find lists like that, the better, because you never know whenever a, a website's going to, to, to stop being active and you won't be able to find it anymore. So the more people posting links and lists and information, the better. Um, Mary says, you have a link, was even going to try a look because you said he was kind of a big guy. <laughs> oh, Mary's using using uh, talk to text. Mary's using talk to text. Okay, so what Cliffside Permaculture is saying, there there are mixes of natives. The the hazelnut trees that I'm growing are are all uh, are all originated from the University of Oregon's program, and they are uh, grown from hybrids of European and native species. And then these are offspring, future offspring of those. Some of them might be patented, so I have to double check patent status before I sell any uh, rooted cuttings or suckers. But seedlings, since they have genetics that are somewhat different from the parent plants, I can get away with selling those all day long. <laughs> now, the ones that Mark is selling are all from the Wisconsin area and further north, some of them up into Canada. So they have a little bit different genetics. And those are all selected, improved, uh, improved American varieties. So what Mark is selling is all American. And what I will have for sale has a little bit of European DNA in it. Not that there's anything wrong with that, just saying. <laughs> there is a little bit of a difference. But that's also the reason why why uh, the forest agriculture nursery plants can grow up to zone three. Okay, uh, we're at an hour and a half, or just about an hour and a half. Guys, I would like to thank you for coming in here and spending time with me tonight. I look forward to seeing you again next week at Wednesday, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, where I am going to be talking about Friends and enemies, and that means pests. Well, at least things that we ordinarily think of as pests. Some of them may not be as pesty as you might think because they all do serve a purpose in the ecosystem, but you can't let them get out of hand, otherwise you won't get your yield. So we'll be looking at ways that we can leverage the forces of nature to be beneficial to our efforts to keep control of those pests, maybe a way to attract certain friends to the garden to keep the enemies in check. And that will be next Wednesday, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. That show is going to be a big slideshow, a very big slideshow. I've got, uh, I think, 41 different pictures already, maybe more that we're going to, going to be putting up. So I'll show you some some examples of different, different pests and different predators and talk some about how they're, uh, how they work together. Uh, yeah, you can expect next next Wednesday to be a fire hose. So we will see you all next Wednesday, 7 p.m. Central. And as always, you know what to do. <laughs>